Chumo, I tried to turn that off and apparently it didn't work. I might have left the fan on because it's not blowing hot air, it's just blowing. Good morning, everybody. It is going to be a beautiful day in San Francisco. I almost sound like I was from the South just there, San Francisco. And it is going to be a beautiful day in the presence of the Lord. Amen. Amen. I'm going to spend just a couple of moments in worship as we, we wait for our GT regular people to come to GT at the regular time, which is in about seven minutes. And here we go. We're going to warm up our hearts. I think the back screen needs to be magnified, but I could be wrong. Yeah, it looks a little bit puny. So this means you're not going to have words for a minute. So let me just tell you this. Next week is Easter. We're excited. Um, we went ahead and did a little test run today, and we opened up the invitation to the entire church to see how many people are comfortable coming back. Right now, I know more people are getting vaccinated. I know that we're getting closer to herd immunity. Last I heard uh, a week and a half ago, roughly, was about 30% of San Francisco has been vaccinated. So I know some people who haven't been comfortable coming back to church are getting closer to being comfortable. I've also heard about some people who are more comfortable in their bed, and it doesn't really have anything to do with feeling safe. They're just used to not having to get dressed to come to church. I'm going to challenge you just a little bit on that. Uh, it is very different worshiping in this room than it is even for me in my living room. Um, and I have heard from many people who've come to church that it is, it's an entirely different experience being here with the brothers and sisters, being here. Now the Spirit of God is everywhere. Don't get us wrong, but the Spirit also moves and comes and does things in a way that's completely unique when we're gathered together. I think that's why the Bible probably tells us to do it. Amen. So, yeah, I'll finish that announcement later because I think we're good to go in the back. Here we go. There is a power, there is a presence holding all heaven, watching Troubled waters quench every thirst, heal what is broken and break every curse. Hallelujah. There is a power so overwhelming, all of creation that bows to its name. Cover every stain, keep every promise, and break every chain. And there is power in this room, and any darkness has to. i 
family. We're just so glad that you were able to join us this morning. But those of you online and those of you who may be able to make it here today, we've already started. <laughs> so I just want to continue to welcome you and continue to ask of you to just posture your hearts. It's been, it's been a good week. And the reason it's been a good week is because we're here this morning. That we made it another Sunday. So we're just going to posture our hearts and pray and, and just ask that God have his way this morning. So glad, so glad, so glad you're able to join us. So Father, we thank you. That when we declare the name of Jesus, everything moves. When we declare the name of Jesus, things are shift. When we declare the name of Jesus, healing is available. When we declare the name of Jesus, things are made new. Father, we ask that your glory descend on your people this morning, not only in this place, but in their living room, in their kitchen, in their car. We ask that you will move this morning. We ask that your Shekinah of your glory will dwell. We ask that you will bring peace upon your people this morning and that you will have your way. Father, whatever it is doing, we pray for the musician. We pray for the word. We pray for every part of today, God, that you will continually move. That you will continue to set your people free. And today is the day that there will be liberation. We thank you this morning, Father, for what you've already done, for what you're about to do. We receive it this morning. Family, we just say, let's posture our hearts. Let's go after him because healing is available in the power of the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord. We love you and we receive it. In Jesus' name we pray, God. Amen. We've waited for this day. We've gathered in your name. We're calling out to you. Show us your glory, Lord. 
You're the infinite You're the ultimate And we trust you We trust you One more time say God you have God you have The final word The final word In my life And God your it's said all, it's said all forever. You are infinite, you're the ultimate, and we trust you, we trust you. You are infinite, you're the ultimate.
Christ our Savior, great in glory. That's right. There is no one higher, there is no, no one, one greater. greater. Now on this Palm Sunday, I have such a sense of great anticipation as I hope you all do. What a special time we commemorate. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. When I was growing up, I went to a little Baptist church and they handed out uh, palm, single palm leaves to everyone as they entered. And I had no idea what that was for. I just liked the idea that they were giving us something. And I would take it home and we would have it up in the house for a while. Oh, Jesus. And we don't have any palm leaves, palm branches today to lay down at the feet of Jesus. But we have our lives. So instead of thinking about what it is that you might not have today, or even in this time of worship, what you might not have to give to Jesus, who deserves it all? Would you lay down your life once again at the feet of Jesus? You see, we commemorate today the day that he rode in to Jerusalem on a donkey. But someday he is coming again riding on a cloud. And I want you to build your anticipation for that moment. It is coming. He is coming again. And so we read in the scripture this morning, we read that Jesus was near. And we read about what he was doing, what he always did. He was healing. He was confessing that, uh, that God is real. But at the same time, there were people that were near him. And our Bible says they were filled with mindless rage. And they were debating each other. And I don't know about you, but I think not much has changed since the time of the Bible. I don't have to look very far to see people who are acting in that same way. Even some people who say they are near Jesus. So apparently, it is not enough just to be near Jesus. We have to over and over again say I surrender all I surrender everything to you my entire life is yours Lord all the bad stuff if there's any good stuff that's all yours too have it all have it all and you know if you looked at that scripture this morning you know that there were those people and they were doing their own thing and what was Jesus doing he was restoring. That's what he does. He restores. And so if you've engaged in mindless rage or debate this week, or if you've just held on to bitterness longer than you know you should, or maybe you've been anxious or depressed, so many people have been over the past year, Jesus is still restoring people today. And he has not left you out of that equation. He is able to restore you today. Have you given up hope? Have you lost that sense of anticipation for who God really is and what he's about to do? Maybe it's in your life. Maybe it's in the life of a family member or a loved one. Today, in this time of worship, I was praying for you that the Lord would restore your hope. We want you to have your way today, Father. Have your way. Would you take away the things that have beset us, the things that we unknowingly or perhaps even intentionally have clung to, and we would lay everything down at your feet. If we had palm branches, we would gladly lay them down in anticipation for what's to come. But instead we say, take our lives. Have our lives, God. Make us yours. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, it's so 
good to be here this morning and to see you all. I know you're all smiling underneath those masks and I'm so glad for it. And hello to you online as well. This is an opportunity for you to give the Lord your tithe. And if you're like me, you are used to having a schedule or a system where when you pay your bills, you pay your tithe. So maybe you've already done that. But for those of you who haven't, we have several ways to give. They're showing up in the comments online. They're also listed on the screen behind me. And if you're also like me, in case you think I'm here because I make the big bucks, I was eligible for the stimulus, but I almost forgot to tithe on it. Admitting that to the whole world right now, to the whole internet. Because it wasn't part of my schedule, my routine. But I wish, you know, that I had been in a state of saying, Lord, I just want you to have everything. And so as soon as that money hit my account, I wish the first thought I had had was, how much should I give to you, Lord? How much should I give to other people? What do you want me to do with this money? It wasn't my first thought, but I got there eventually. Let me pray for you. Lord God, you are so good. You are so good. In the middle of our trauma and drama and chaos and fear, you enter in and you provide. You provide just what we need. So we ask you, Lord, would you do that once again? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, if you're online, then you're probably seeing some people that you don't know in the comments. And if that's true, please go ahead and say hi to each other. It's an opportunity to get to know people a little bit better just by reaching out and saying hi. And if you are here in person, you might want to raise an eyebrow at the person next to you, do a little wave, acknowledge that it's good to be in the house of the Lord. I mean announcements for today. First off is about Good Friday service this Friday, April 2nd at 6 p.m. Um, kind of continuing off of what Vanessa was saying, God just laid on my heart to tell everyone here and remind myself that this is a time to just bring everything to Him, to lay it at His feet, to see what He will do with all those burdens that have been on our hearts, on our souls, on our minds, about ourselves, our families, our countries, because when we bring it to Him on Friday, you better believe He will see, you will see what He does with it on Sunday. You will see how He will resurrect things that you thought were dead. You will see things that you thought were buried come to life. So on Friday, come to this Good Friday service. You'll see your registration link um, on Facebook, or you can find it on your on the email that was sent out on Thursday. But I just want to say that if you are there, if you bring your heart, your soul, everything that has been on your heart since 2020, since 2021, since Easter of last year, to this service, God will rise new things. He will raise up new things on Sunday, things that you didn't even know to pray about, things that you didn't even know to think about. He will show you that his resurrection is also a revelation. It's a a revolution so I just pray and I hope that all of you feel in your heart that this Easter is going to be a special Easter God is gonna bring forth things that you never saw possible not only in your life in the life of your family people you've been praying for and in our church family so I just want to say that this is gonna be an Easter like no other and to bring that Easter in We'll be having prayer meetings this week, Monday through Thursday, from 8 to 10, I mean, sorry, from 6 to 8 a.m. They'll be in person here at GT or on Zoom, so whatever you feel comfortable, however you feel led, just come, because this will be the start of your Easter, your, resu your resurrection, resurrection, your revolution. And I don't know, if you haven't been to a, a morning meeting, I just want to say, beautiful, magical, world-changing things happen at these meetings. I remember the first one I came to, I was studying for one of these big medical school exams, and 
God just said, you need to carve out time because your test score is not going to be as important as things that I do this week and the ways that I move this week. And I just want to tell you that there was a peace that came over me that week that got me through that entire season of hardship, a season where people fall into depression, fall into sickness, fall into things that they never even thought was possible for them. But I want to say it's through these prayer meetings, not only the prayers that we were putting out um, for ourselves, but also remembering that we are, have the power to move nations with our words, with our prayers, with the things that the Lord lays on our hearts. So I just want to say, come and see what God will do. It starts Monday, 6 to 8 a.m., and it goes through Thursday, but it doesn't end there because Easter season is upon us, and it is going to last all of 2021. So just get ready for what is to come, GT, and good morning. Good morning, Toke, and good morning, everybody else. I'm coming down. Give me a second. You can turn and wave to somebody if you didn't do it earlier. I saw some of you wave. That was good. But some of the rest of you just kind of parked. Today I just did one ear on the way down. I figured I'm only going to have this thing on for like three seconds. One ear it is. Oh, it is so good to be here. Um, tomorrow I'm working really hard in my mind to figure out how the technical aspect of having a prayer meeting that's on Zoom and in person is going to work. It's not the same thing. Is it? Don't you do that every Sunday? No, it's very, very different. It's a whole different technical setup. Um, tomorrow, I've, if you see me, I'll have a little soundboard down here with doing things and it'll go straight into a computer and that will go to Zoom. It won't go through that camera. So if you come to that prayer meeting, which I encourage you to do, please be patient. I'm asking you to be patient in advance because we might be working out some technical things on the fly. I'm going to set up this afternoon after service to anticipate as many of the problems as I can, but especially uh, for the people online. Um, I encourage you to please bear with me and have some patience. I thought it would be worthwhile to, to experiment with some in-person prayer meetings. Amen? Amen. A, a quote also went through my head uh, just a few moments ago. I can't remember exactly what Pastor Vanessa was saying about the tithe, but I just got to share this quote with you because it just came out of left field, which sometimes the Holy Spirit. If it's the Holy Spirit, it'll land. If it was left field, it won't. And it goes like this. The tithe can actually be a stumbling block to the wealthy because it convinces them that they're not really trying to serve God and mammon because giving 10% doesn't cost them anything. I'm going to say that again. The tithe can actually be a stumbling block to the wealthy. It convinces them that they're not actually trying to serve both God and mammon because they're able to give 10% without it actually costing them anything. Just, mm, that settled in my heart a little bit. I'll let it settle in yours. If 10% is costly, just keep on, keep on giving sacrificially. Amen, that's the, that's the bottom line. Well, next Sunday is Easter Sunday already. I'm kind of giving you a preview into my message already. You can call this like the Easter Sunday message for believers. Because uh, next week, I anticipate we'll have some visitors, and I plan to preach a message that will meet them where they are. Uh, I think there are lots of people who will be here next Sunday who would not consider in any way coming today, if you know what I mean. And so this is my Easter message to you. I know it's Palm Sunday, so I'm not going to skip over Palm Sunday and pretend it's not happening. But uh, I'm just kind of laying the groundwork for you. This coming week is where... Our calendars and the calendar time in the Bible sync up like no other time during the year. In John chapter 12, hold on, I'm just going to do this so I'm not distracted while I'm talking. Everybody needs to see my cool imprinted lining here. That's not why I'm doing it. It's because my sleeves are flapping and they're driving me crazy. All right, there we go. It's not about, never mind, never mind. In John chapter 12, Jesus tells us, Jesus doesn't tell us, John tells us that on the Sunday before Passover, Jesus rode into the city of Jerusalem with his followers following him. That's what followers do. They follow him. And crowds of people gathered around him, going before him, crowding along the road from Bethany to meet him 
to try to catch even a glimpse of him on his way from Bethany to Jerusalem. Many of them were there because they had heard that Jesus had raised a man from the dead. Lazarus was from the town of Bethany, with just two miles outside of Jerusalem. Many of them would have heard about this miracle. Some of them had no doubt been present when Jesus fed the 5,000 in Galilee, or when he said fed the 4,000 in the region of the Decapolis. They flocked to him that day, almost exactly 2,000 years ago, with one hope and one mind. And that was that as he entered Jerusalem, God would perform some amazing and indisputable sign that would prove to everyone that Jesus was their long-expected Messiah, that he was the deliverer of the people, predicted and promised by the great prophets like Isaiah and Daniel and Zechariah and Malachi, that he would be crowned king of the Jews and then lead the Jewish people in a great victory over the enemy, the Roman Empire. Now, just to put things in perspective, the entire land of Israel had about a million people, and that includes Jews and non-Jews. The Roman Empire, on the other hand, was about 15% of the entire population of the world, with about 45 million people. One million people in the war against 45 million people. Now what Jesus actually did, starting on that Sunday, as he rode into Jerusalem, explains why, just one week later, and especially after his crucifixion by the Romans, that so few Jews would still be on board with the idea that he might be the Messiah, God's anointed, the Savior. We find the first signs (laughs) that Jesus had different plans than this, Early on in his ministry, of course, where he's saying things like, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on one cheek, offer them the other. If a soldier forces you to carry their equipment one mile, carry it a second mile also voluntarily. Love your enemy. Pray for those who persecute you. Blessed are the meek and the peacemakers. These are revolutionary teachings, all right, but not the kind of revolution that the people were looking for. At this point in his ministry, even John the Baptist, some of you might have heard of him, Jesus said about him, there is no one who has ever been born who is greater than this man. Well, in this man sent messengers disciples to Jesus and say, like, hey, we're a little confused, Jesus. Are you the Messiah that we've been waiting for? Or should we continue to look for someone else? Someone who's doing more of the kinds of things that we're expecting the Messiah to do. And many of you know how Jesus answered. Go tell John what you see in here right now. The blind see, the deaf hear, the lame are made to walk, and the poor have the good news preached to them. What other proof do you need, disciples of John? And by the way, he added at the end, blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Another way you might say that is blessed is the one who is not disappointed by me. We'll come back to that in just a moment. Going back to Jesus coming into Jerusalem. His method of transportation on his way to the appointment should have been another clue that he was who he had been saying he was all along, rather than the warrior king that fit their mold. A couple of weeks ago, I accompanied the Gartrell family to Colma for the burial of Kathy Elarms. Now, my wife and I don't drive a Cadillac or anything, Our Mazda 3 is a perfectly dignified car, but the Mazda was in the shop for repairs. And so all we had to drive was the church's little Prius. And even this stereotype 
that a pastor has to have a certain kind of car to command any kind of respect on an important occasion, like a funeral, was enough to make me feel a little bit insecure about the kind of car I pulled up in at Cypress Lawn. Now I want you to keep that in mind, keep that in mind as we think about Jesus' ride on Palm Sunday. Because conquering kings rode into cities on war horses. And the Messiah, or so they thought, was supposed to have an army with him, waving spears and swords in the air. Jesus, as we're told in Matthew 21, came to Jerusalem riding on a donkey. Just hear Shrek in my head right now. I can't, I can't, just. He was riding on a donkey. His followers were waving palm branches in the air and not weapons. Then, at the height of people's expectation, Jesus enters the city. And then he enters the temple, the place that represented the presence and the power and the authority of God. Symbolically, think in your mind, very similar to what happened at our U.S. Capitol building on January 6th. That kind of symbol of power in the nation. And Mark 11, 11 says this. Jesus looked around at everything and he went back to Bethany with his 12 disciples. Bethany was where he had started from. Bethany is where he'd climbed on the donkey and where that entire procession had taken place for those two miles into the city with his disciples and the followers in the crowds shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Long live the king of Israel. He comes to the city, looks around, does a little sightseeing tour, goes back to where he started. This is a little like a story, it reminds me of a story I saw on a TV show recently. Ladies, imagine you've been dating your boyfriend for eight long years. It's Valentine's Day. Your boyfriend surprises you by showing up early at your place and he's cooked breakfast for you. Candlelight breakfast. And as you're eating, he he pulled the blinds. (laughs) Candlelight breakfast. And as you're eating your eggs benedict or your huevos rancheros, whatever it is that is your favorite dish for breakfast, millionaire's bacon, he pulls out from his pocket a black velvet box, holds it out to you across the table, slowly opens the box with this hand, which I can't move or else you won't hear me. And inside the box is... A chain necklace with a little heart locket on it. Now, obviously, guys, that was a little lesson in what not to do. (laughs) You can maybe get away with that on Valentine's Day 1, but by 3, that should have a different shape inside. Anyway, we're just going to go away and leave that alone. Now, we're obviously talking about two very different kinds of letdowns here. Two very different scales of importance, but expectations are clearly not being met in both of these cases. Now there's a significant difference in the fact that Jesus was, in fact, the Messiah. Whatever they decided about him, he was the Messiah. The guy in our scenario kind of turns out to be the guy who doesn't propose on Valentine's Day after eight years. So these are very different situations. There are just a couple things that I want to point out this morning about the ways that people ended up disappointed with Jesus. Can you say disappointed with Jesus? Jesus was. Do you know that I know of so many people in the last year who have been disappointed with Jesus for so many different reasons. And I want to tell you that it is not a sin to be disappointed with Jesus. It is what you do with that disappointment that matters. Does it drive you to him? Or does it give you an excuse, the excuse that you're wanting to walk away from him? 
to maybe do things the easier way. It never is easier than following Jesus, by the way. Jesus was, in the sense that mattered to most people, weak. W-E-A-K. He was weak. This might sound a little offensive to our ears or even blasphemous. But 2 Corinthians 3.14 says that Jesus was crucified in power. No. It says that Jesus was crucified in weakness. But he lives because of the power of God. The passage we looked at last week, Philippians 2, chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. It talks about the all-powerful, infinite, and eternal God leaving behind the power and privileges of divinity, becoming nothing, a servant, an obedient slave. Yes, he retained by the power of the Holy Spirit, the power to cast out demons. He had the power to heal the sick. At least on two occasions, he fed huge crowds of people with a few loaves of bread and a couple of fish. He had even the power to raise the dead. And people loved all those things. They followed him in hopes that they would get to be on the receiving end of one of those miracles. Some people, a lot of people, the Bible tells us, like a woman who had a reproductive hemorrhage for 12 years, like the blind men who called out, Son of David, have mercy on me, like the leper who approached him and said, you can cleanse me if you're willing. All of these pushed past their fears and they reached out and touched Jesus and as a result, they were healed. And I want to tell you this morning that Jesus still has the power to heal. Jesus still has the power to deliver from affliction and addiction and oppression and possession. Jesus still has the power for miraculous provision. And we desperately need that power. In fact, I'm going to pause for just a minute, and it might take me a second to figure out how to kickstart this message. But Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, if there are people in there, I know there are people in this room who need healing in their bodies. And I call on you right now to show that you are the same God yesterday, today, and forever. To say that you have the same power back then that you have it right now. That you are still a God who heals bodies. That you love us enough not to leave us with the afflictions that we carry in our bodies. I pray that you would heal right now. I pray that you would heal areas that are recovering from surgery. I pray that you would repair organs that have suffered damage, memories that have suffered loss. I pray that you would heal autoimmune disorders. I pray that you would heal diabetes. I pray that you would heal rheumatoid arthritis. I pray that you would heal all over this room right now, that people who have headaches right now. They would walk out of this room even though I'm shouting so loud that their ears hurt right now, that their headache would be gone by the time they leave this place. I pray that you would heal. I pray that you would set people free from the bondages that afflict them and suppress them and hold them down and beat them down. I pray that you would break chains right now in the name of Jesus, that tormenting thoughts would go right now in the name of Jesus the doubt and depression and despair would leave right now in the name of Jesus and instead faith and confidence and hope in God would rise up and take their place in their hearts. I pray that you would cause forgiveness to flow in places where there is bitterness and resentment. And I pray, God, I pray, I pray that where people are angry with you, that they would bring their, bring you their authentic feelings, just like those palm branches that Pastor Vanessa said we would lay at this altar. I pray that we would lay our disappointments with you at the foot of the cross this morning, and you would replace them with your peace and with your affirmation that we are still your beloved children, that no matter how much or how often we've shaken our fists at heaven in anger at you, You would receive us back with the love of the Father. Meet people in this place this morning where there is need, 
where there is desperate need, where someone needs food, where someone needs clothing, where someone needs money to pay so that the heat bill or the water doesn't get shut off or so that they can stay in their apartment one more month. Will they wait for that assistance check to come back and their job to restart? I pray that you would provide, Lord Jesus, and do it in a way that you get the glory. Do it in a way that that person knows that you saw that need and that you wanted to meet it and you did it to show them how much you love them and how powerful you are. Do these things and God, I know that there are more needs. There are needs I'm not naming. There's hurting hearts that I haven't identified and we know that you will do above and beyond all that we have asked and all that we can imagine you're able to do simply because we're asking and we're coming to you in faith. But more than that, because you are a good, good God and you love your children. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. By the way, I know this takes the miracle out of it, but it was a nudge in my heart. I have been meaning to say again and again, and I've remembered to do it sometimes. If you are online or if you're in this room and you have a need, I'm thinking especially of a financial need. We do not want you to choose between feeding your family and paying the rent this month. So please email the church. Don't call the church. You should call the church. The voicemail doesn't get checked as often as the emails do, but reach out to us. Put a note in the Facebook feed right now. Reach out to us and let us know. We have not had to say no to a single person in the last year who has reached out for help. That is all because God has provided. And some of that provision has been downright miraculous. And so if we're just passing it on to you, it's still miraculous. I take it back. I'm not taking the miraculous out of anything. It's a miracle that God continues to provide for us through a year like last year. So just like we are thrilled and we will be thrilled when God begins to answer some of these prayer requests. The people back then were thrilled with the power of Jesus. But family... There was another form of power that Jesus just would not walk in at all. When the people were getting ready to come and take him and make him king by force. You know what he did? He slipped away through the crowd. He went and like put his little magic disappearing cloak on and went, I'm out of here. When the rulers came to him with the question, hey, Jesus. Should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? By the way, these aren't just taxes. These are, this is tribute. A tribute is not a tax. A tribute says, you rule over us. And if we don't give you this tribute, acknowledging that you are our ruler, you're going to come and wipe us off the face of the map. Because you're 15% of the world's population and we're measly 1 million. It's tribute to Caesar. It's like a tax to honor him. You can give tribute to somebody. It's very close to worshiping someone. There's a very famous worship song, in fact, called My Tribute to the Lord. So they come to ask him, should we pay this tribute to Caesar or not? Because after all, what kind of conquering revolutionary king would encourage his followers to pay taxes to the king that he's about to overthrow with his army, right? They were trying to trick him because they didn't believe he was the Messiah. They're trying to trick him into saying, no, of course we shouldn't pay so they could turn him over to Caesar and have him executed and get him out of, this, get him out of the way. But Jesus says, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Which, by the way, is a whole lot more complicated than saying pay the tribute tax, but that's for a different sermon. He doesn't say, however, forget about taxes. That pagan emperor is going down and I'm going to take my rightful place on his throne. He doesn't say that. And that's the kind of thing that they would have been expecting their faithful Jewish king Messiah to say in response to a question like that. When Jesus is finally arrested, Peter, chief disciple numero uno, he thinks it's revolution time. And he starts swinging his sword. He slashes off the ear of the high priest's servant, whose name is Malchus. 
Not only does Jesus rebuke Peter, put away your sword. Those who live by the sword will die by the sword. Don't you think, Peter, if you've still not figured out who I am, don't you know that I could call on my father right now and he would send thousands upon thousands of angels to fight and keep me from being arrested if my kingdom was of this world? Or if that's how we fought to establish my kingdom? After soundly rebuking Peter, what's he do next? He goes over to Malchus. Well, he goes over to the ear, wherever it may have landed picks it up and sticks it back on Malchus's head and heals him. Now, let's talk. Let's, let's reason with each other. I'm the general. You're in a battle. I've sent you out to war. And every time you strike an opponent to the ground, I come over and I heal them so that they can get back up and shoot or swing their sword or do whatever they do. You just fought and defeated the opponent, but I'm coming over and healing them every time you strike one of them down. Now, either you're going to end up one very frustrated soldier, or you're eventually going to get the message that I haven't come to fight this kind of battle. Jesus did not come to deliver Israel from the Roman Empire. And I'm going to slide this one in here too. He did not come to safeguard the political freedoms of 21st century Americans. Jesus didn't come on a war horse as a general. He came into his capital city on a donkey as a peacemaker. He was a deliverer. You better believe it. But what he delivered us from was the power of sin. A much more devastating and threatening power than any empire on this earth will ever be. He was a conqueror, all right. But what he conquered was death and the grave. Something that has a lot more power over you than any human government, any nation will ever be able to have. And he won the battle. He won the battle, but the way that he won, by our standards at least, was by losing. He lived the exact message that he preached. He illustrated with his own life exactly what he meant with his teachings when he said things like, the lapsed will be first. The humble will be exalted. If you want to be great, you have to become a servant. It's not the ones who get, but the ones who give who will be blessed by God. And if you want to save your life, you've got to lose it. You see, the people with the kind of power that we tend to think of as power, Jesus allowed them to kill him. And the people who had hoped Jesus would seize that kind of power for himself and liberate them politically ended up very disappointed with Jesus. What I want to preach to you today is the Lord of Lords who comes to you humbly, gently, riding on a donkey. Why is this good news? Well, I was going to say take a look around, but don't do that. Just think about yourselves. We aren't very powerful in the scheme of things, are we? The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians says, When you were called, not many of you were wise. How many of you were wealthy by the world's standards, influential or noble by the world's standards? Jesus isn't like the social media influencer with 17 million followers who makes us feel like we could never be that beautiful, that popular, that artistic, that funny, that talented. I think if Jesus had an Instagram account, it would have a few pictures at most. Jesus with a leper. Jesus with a child. Maybe Jesus on a donkey. Definitely, and possibly only this one, Jesus on a cross. To say, this, my children, my followers, this is when I was at my absolute best, right here. This is when I was revealing my most authentic self. 
This is what I who I could show you who I was if I could show you anything about me and nothing else about me. This is the angle I'd want you to see of my face. When I was the most despised in the eyes of the world, when I was the least attractive to look at, when I was at... When I was at my absolute weakest moment, precisely then is when God's resurrection power was getting ready to explode into full view from beyond the other side of the grave. This is why Paul says, my friends, in 2 Corinthians 12, 10, that is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in hardships, in insults, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You see, Jesus didn't die on a cross only to show us how far he would go to prove his love for us. Oh, he absolutely did do that, and hallelujah that he did that. On the cross, Jesus shows us who we really are without him. He shows us our true condition, powerless, helpless, disfigured, and condemned. And his death on the cross saves us from all of that. But he also shows us that the way we are being saved from being powerless isn't by becoming powerful ourselves. It's by trusting in the power of God. The way that we overcome isn't by bulking up. It's not by buying guns. It's by trusting in God. 1 Peter chapter 2.23 says that he did not retaliate when he was insulted. He didn't threaten revenge when he suffered. He left his hands in the case of God. In the, he left his case in the hands of God who always judges fairly. He trusted. The purpose of this verse, by the way, isn't to get us to admire Christ's character, though it should definitely do that. Peter's point in this verse is very much the same as the point in Paul's passage from last week. We talked about it in Philippians 2, where Paul first says, here's the example of Jesus. Each of you should have the same mindset as him. Hey, here's the example of Timothy. He has the same mindset as Christ. Here's the example of Epaphroditus. He has the same mindset as Christ. And finally, here's my own example. If you've seen anything Christ-like in my teaching, if you've heard anything Christ-like in my teaching, then put that into it. practice. Imitate me. And what Peter is saying here in verse 223 is the fact that we are supposed to imitate Jesus in this way. Where's the proof? Rewind. Two verses. Put it up. Oh. To this you were called. Say those words out loud so that you're accountable. Maybe to this I was called. Because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. How much clearer could it be? Lately, I've been looking at all kinds of ads on Facebook for churches, for Easter services. One of them said, come for powerful music and encouraging teaching. Please don't get me wrong. I'm not criticizing this church. I'm not criticizing any church. I understand that what they're trying to do is draw people to what they cannot possibly yet understand using things that they will understand. I expect that we'll have some visitors here next week and I plan to preach a message, just like I said earlier, that meets them where they are. I'm not gonna preach this message to them. This is a family message. I told you that at the beginning. Sorry, Facebook, your family now. I, I hope you're still with me. I certainly don't want our times of worship to be described as powerless. But that's a lot more than powerful music. 
And I don't think that preaching should be discouraging. I hope this is challenging today, but if, if you're discouraged, please send me an email and I'll, I'll try to help you understand why that wasn't the intent. But when Jesus, the one that we will preach on Easter Sunday, had to say to John the Baptist, blessed are those who are not offended by me. I can't help but wondering if we're advertising a different Jesus than the one who said, none of you can be my disciple unless you first deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. The, the God who answered Paul when he prayed, God, remove this affliction from me. This is how God answered Paul. No, I won't take away your affliction. Yes, I know that Satan is using it to torment you, but it's really a gift from me to keep you humble. I want your life to be sustained and empowered by grace, my grace, and my grace will be sufficient for you. You don't have any real power anyway. And the only way my power will have any room to be demonstrated through you is if you are weak. My power is perfected in your weakness. Nothing, by the way, is weaker than a dead person, which is why a crucified Jesus, dead three days in the grave, was the perfect place for God to display the extent of his power when he raised him from the dead. God chose, or have we forgotten, God chose the weak things of this world to shame those things that are strong. Have we forgotten that God chose the foolish things of this world to shame the wisdom of the wise, and he chose the despised things, things counted as nothing at all, and used them to bring to nothing those things that the world considers important. And what I want to say to you this morning is, what if you and I, is it possible that we have absorbed just enough of our culture's expectations? The kind that create the stereotype that the pastor has to drive a certain kind of car. What if we've absorbed enough of those expectations? What if we like to shout amen to the scripture, my power is perfected in your weakness, but we haven't really learned to see our actual weaknesses as potential doorways to God's power. So let me make this really practical. If a donkey was good enough for the king of kings, then there's no doubt in my mind that God's grace is sufficient for you. If Jesus could endure six hours on a Friday hanging tortured on a cross, then God's grace will be sufficient for you. It'll be sufficient for your challenges with your family. It will be sufficient for the doubt that you've been wrestling with lately for this last year, maybe for longer, maybe. I don't know where you're feeling weak this morning. I don't know where you're feeling inadequate. This past year has certainly created plenty of opportunities for us to feel like we're not up to the task. Maybe you're struggling to forgive. Maybe you're having a hard time moving forward from a crisis or a tragedy in your past. Maybe you have a hard time believing that God is going to provide. Maybe you're sick and you're getting ready to give up on the possibility that God still heals. Well, I want to tell you that his grace is still sufficient for you. And if you wake up doubting in the morning, his grace will still be sufficient for you. If you wake up sicker tomorrow morning, his grace will still be sufficient for you. If you get in a fight with that person who you're praying that the relationship will be restored with, his grace is still sufficient for you. And what if, what if God's not waiting for you to get yourself together? What if he's waiting for an invitation to him 
for you to solve your power problem with his unlimited resources and power? What if the situation you're in feels impossible because it is impossible and God's just waiting for you to give him the space to show you that with God, anything is impossible. Anything is possible. Nothing is impossible. What if your feeling of powerlessness this morning isn't a problem to be solved? What if it's a wide open door for God to do what only he can do anyway? What if, church, what if a king riding on a donkey means that his grace really is sufficient for every one of our situations. Now, I said it twice that I would come back to this. Maybe you're disappointed with Jesus. Maybe. Am I, if I'm honest, am I disappointed with Jesus? I haven't asked myself that question. I preached it to you and asked you to ask yourself, but I didn't ask myself. There are some people just this week, I'll be real, just this week, I was praying on the beach where I always pray, and there were some people that I've been praying for for three years to be healed. And that's not very long in the scheme of things. But what you know what I said to God? I put my mask on for this because I'm going to come out from behind the... Because i got to act into it because I walk. I, pay, I walk down the beach when I pray. I was praying and I said, God, I have been praying for three years for these people to be healed. Where is the God who heals when we call? I'll let you decide if that's disappointment with God or not. I think it might be frustration, maybe a little anguish. You know what I didn't sense from God when I prayed that? Disappointment with me. I think God knows what he's doing. And I think that if God can use anything for my good, he can use my disappointment with the fact that he's not answering my prayers on my timeline. He can use that for my good. And so right now, I'm just, I'm just processing this right in front of you real time. And so right now, I make the decision that God is using this for my good. I am frustrated to get up here and preach to you a God who heals and have to admit that there are people that I have prayed for every single day for three years and they are still sick. There are others that I pray for and they're healed. Hallelujah. Maybe I should focus on that for a minute. But I still have frustration in my spirit that I prayed for all of you this morning and it's possible that one of you would walk out and not be healed. That frustrates me. I'm just being honest with you. But I trust that somehow God is using it for the good of those who love God and who are called according to his promises. Because in my powerlessness, my answer isn't power that comes from me. It's trust in the one who has the power to work out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. You hear that scripture a lot in this church because I depend on the truth of that scripture an awful lot. Now, whether I feel victorious, whether I feel defeated, whether I feel worthy, whether I feel acceptable, whether I'm in a good mood, whether I'm in a bad mood, whether I'm, I worship. If I need healing, if I've just prayed for somebody and they've been healed, I worship. If I feel the presence of God, if I don't feel the presence of God, I worship. Paul said, I've discovered the secret of having plenty and having not enough. I know what it is to have much and I know what it is to go without. 
and I've learned the secret of being content in all circumstances. And that is, somebody help me, I can do all things through Christ. If you take out the through Christ, that verse is the biggest false advertisement and lie that's ever been told. <laughs> I can do all things. Oh, I take that back. It's still through him who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ, through him who strengthens me. I don't muster up the strength to do it. I might have to muster up a choice of my will. But if that's all the strength I can give, then you better believe that Jesus is going to supply all the rest of the strength that I need to do it. All that I have to do is decide, and half the time he's given me the... <laughs> For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his purpose. It's him giving me the strength to even choose to want to do the right thing. And it's him giving me the strength to be able to walk the right thing out. So I come back to him again and again and again. And I say, God, I can't do this. God, I can't make it. God, I don't know the answer. God, I don't know the right thing to do in this situation. God, I'm hopeless. God, I'm hurting. God, these people who are depending on me, I don't have anything to offer them. If you don't do something. And so I worship. I worship because I don't have some other kind of generator that I can plug the cord into to get the power that I need. I'm just, I'm, I'm helpless. I'm powerless. I'm defenseless. I'm resourceless. I'm useless without Christ who gives me strength. And because of his grace, he keeps giving me strength, and He keeps giving me strength, and He keeps giving me strength, and that grace will always be sufficient. No matter what, no matter what. So if you've got to sing this song through tears of heartache, through tears of confession, through tears of shame over some things that you haven't brought to God, through some tears of mm, struggle, or if you can sing it through tears of rejoicing at the recognition of how God, faithful God has been and how limitless His grace has been to you, one way or the other, let's lift up this praise to God. Let's declare who He is. Let's declare that He is the one that our help comes from. He is the one who provides. He is the one who leads, who guides, who protects. He's the one who heals. Come on, I'm gonna stick these in. My God is awesome. He can move mountains. Keep me in the valley. Hide me from the rain. My God is awesome. Heals me where I'm broken. Strength where I've been weakened. Forever he will reign. Back to the beginning, say, My God is awesome, He can move mountains, keep me in the valley, hide me from the rain. My God is awesome, heals me when I'm broken, strength where I've been weakened, forever He will reign. I'll sing it, My God.
church, I for one am glad that Jesus came humbly, gentle, riding on a donkey, I'm thankful that he showed us the way. <laughs> he showed us the way to peace. He showed us the way to peace. Not to try to be powerful in ourselves, but to rely on the power of God who raises the dead, to rely on the power of God who always judges justly. And that power is available, it is poured out. It is poured out on us in never ending way. Amen. 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 So, I haven't ended church this early in like since October or something, so I'm going to sing one more song. I just got to figure out what.
Come on, say so good, so good. That's a hit for the sound booth. My God is good, good, so good. That will never change. My God is good, good, so good. Pain won't steal my praise. My God is good, good, so you were here and I pray that the Spirit of God would water the seeds that have been planted this morning that you would not go out of here and, and uproot with your decisions with your thoughts those things that God has planted but that you would guard and jealously defend and protect the good work that God has started in you this morning and he will carry it on to completion until the day he calls us home in Jesus name Amen, amen, and amen. God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. We will have prayer meetings tomorrow morning. We have Good Friday service this Friday. And today, if you really want to get in the last minute, you can text Pastor Vanessa and you can go to the membership class, but you're going to have to have some serious grace that's sufficient for you for that to work out. Amen, amen. I'll see you soon, as in at the front door. Please don't try to beat me there, please, please, please. I'm running. Here I go.